Hi, everyone. Welcome to Nam Watch Review, part of Nam Talk Network. On this show, we review the latest film drops or throwbacks celebrating a milestone while eating and drinking our favorite movie snacks and drinks. Um, just before we start, don't forget that we do have merch now. Um, you can find that in our shop in the About section on Twitch or by um, typing in a link, Merch, and we'll give you a link as well. Uh, I'm your host, Eric Ramirez, and tonight... I am drinking a Voodoo Ranger IPA, Cashmere because it's my new favorite, and I can't get enough of them. Although their new teas are delicious as well. Um, and also eating a giant brownie from KFC. Ooh, that's a which, big brownie. Thank you, Mother, for purchasing them, because I'm going to eat this whole thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, I want to introduce our guests for tonight. Kyle and Kenji, thank you guys so much for being here. Um Kyle, we'll start with you. Uh, what are you snacking and drinking on tonight? So tonight, um, I have a staple because we're watching a we're watching a movie for kids. <laughs> um, I have some children's taquitos, and I have some chips, and I have some grapes. And it's totally not because that's what was left over in my fridge. Totally not. It was all planned. And for drinks, I have water because obviously. And I also have my special little buddy. Because, you know, this is all about childhood friends. This childhood friend costs $200 because he's a special limited edition stuffed animal. But, you know. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> well, I don't know if I would spend $200 on that, but I might. Don't put it past me because it's a very good possibility that I might. His head comes off. Oh. Nice. <laughs> We'll save that for later because we'll need that. But <laughs> but thank you for being here. Um, Kenji, I know you're driving, so please be safe and please be careful. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, okay. <laughs> what are you going to snack on? And do you have anything to drink with you, water or anything? Uh, I have a katsu sandwich uh, that I just got from uh, the Japanese supermarket. And I've got myself some water. Exactly. I said, I said essentially when it's a sense show, but anyway. Uh, but yeah. But yeah. Nice. I, that, that's what I'm going to be snacking on today. Good. Good. Well, like I said, please be safe. You know you're going to park here soon, but be safe while we yeah. continue this. <laughs> uh, but thank you guys for being here. Um, and again, before we start, I want to let you guys know that we are still fundraising for the Trevor Project uh, with a goal of $200. Um, and so please check that out, uh, comment below. And if you want to get more about that and donate, it's a great cause for LGBTQIA youth. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, but today uh, we are talking about the movie that just came out, Imaginary, about our imaginary friends. So we all kind of have bears. This is my boyfriend's bear. I stole it from him. So <laughs> here we that. And then Kyle has his. Um, so before we get into the breakdown of this movie, I did want to ask you guys, did you guys ever have a imaginary childhood friend? And I know there's a lot of movies out there, but what are your thoughts on them making imaginary friend movies? Is it done? Is it outplayed? Do you want to see more and more? We'll start with you on this one, Kyle. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, my, my first imaginary friends were the cast of Jurassic Park. I'm burying my soul. I'm burying my soul. Okay, the but the cast and crew of Jurassic Park were were my first imaginary friends, um, and we had all kinds of adventures with dinosaurs, uh, because I saw Jurassic Park when I was six, because that's how, what you do in my state, um, but I think it's fine. I mean, that's essentially what Hollywood is about, and there, it's not like this isn't the first imaginary friend movie that's come out. It's not like it's not a trope that horror has played with before. This one is a little bit. <laughs> He's cute. This one is a little bit, um, <laughs> he's cute. It looks like Chauncey. <laughs> he does look like Chauncey. He, he is as unnerving as Chauncey, but he's very cute and very well loved. But I mean, I grew up with, um, I don't know. I think that if they had done something like the Velveteen Rabbit and then tried to make it a horror property, that would have been a problem for me. But this was a bear. I mean, you know, it was fine. <laughs> Not as good as Blumhouse's other bear movie. <laughs> Which, sadly, we are not reviewing that tonight. We should have, but... I, I came prepared, but, you know. <laughs> um, before we get to Kenji, because 
Uh, but I did have a childhood friend as well. Uh, it was a little doll. It was spooky. It was probably evil. My parents had to get rid of it because it was one of those types of situations. So they had to get rid of that. Um, I'm kind of, we haven't had an imaginary, I mean, we're getting two this year. Um, we have this one and then we have If, um, which is the actual kid-friendly version. I'm kind of over the imaginary like friend thing because I don't think they've done it well in years. Um, they did it, but not well. Um, but I was excited to see this one in hopes. Um, but with me, Bloomhouse is either hit or miss, and this was not a complete miss, but not a hit as well. Um, but uh, Kenji, did you have a childhood friend, and what do you think about like the imaginary friend tropes in movies and everything? So it's hard to say which one my first one was, because um, like all of my toys ended up be having their own sentience in a way. You know, <laughs> like... You know, like my, I was doing what Toy Story. I I was imagining Toy Story before Toy Story, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. So like, but I mean, if I have to say like my longest friend, I still got him. It's a, it's a, it's a bear that's like, it's a, it's older than me. Uh, it's called Kuma, which literally just means bear in Japanese. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, he's not with me today. Uh, unfortunately, but yeah, uh, he was, he was my oldest friend. I had a, I had a little Kumachan, we called them. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, uh, what do you I think mean, about like yeah. the imaginary film, imaginary friend films and everything? So I feel like it can be done well and it can be done very predictably. And I feel like, I feel like you know, you know this might have been a little bit predictable in sense. And I mean, I mean, I'm not, I, I kind of agree with, with, with Kyle, the idea of like, if they had turned the Velveteen rabbit into a horror property, I would have had an issue with the same thing. Like kind of like how they did with Winnie the Pooh. It's like, yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, it's like, it, it seems like a fun parody for like an SNL level, like skit maybe, but like not as like a full fledged, like, like a, uh, film and that's kind of what this felt like I felt like yeah I just I don't know it seems like it's kind of hard to do anything really new with it and it just seems like by the end of this film it just seems like they were really trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel for trying to get some originality in the story oh yeah no I completely agree um now that we're kind of like talking about the movie I do want to get your popcorn ratings I'll go ahead and go first. Um, I did give it a 2.5 <clears throat> um, out of popcorns because it was it was okay movie. You had your jump scares. Like, it was kind of laid out. The story kind of lacked. The acting kind of lacked. The imagination, even though this movie is called imaginary, was definitely lacking. Um, I definitely, like, jumping into research and everything, there are several people out there are just like, was this written by AI? Because there was no like depth to it. I thought it was an okay movie. Kind of reminded me of like early 2000s movies, like um, Darkness Falls and everything like that. Like you got it, you're good. But it's nothing to write home about for me. Um, go see it. I mean, it's, it'll be a good time. You'll get a good couple of jump scares. But other than that, 2.5, hit the middle of the road. Um, Kenji, what were your, what is your popcorn rating and why? Uh. 2.5 as well because it was it was a I felt like it was a very safe movie I feel like it was very they played it very safe um I mean I, I mean they, they had some nice moments with it um I won't lie that one of the twists that ends up happening in it I wasn't was actually I wasn't expecting so that was a nice touch and um but other than that I, I i will say that the majority of the time i felt like it was very uh yeah you know, I, I don't know it, it just it felt like i was i've seen this movie before mm -hmm. and throughout watching the movie it felt like i've seen this movie before and eric you and i were talking about it before kyle showed up we couldn't figure out what movie it was. I threw out a couple movies out, but like it's, still, but we're like, no, it's not really it. So like, it's hard to really, but yeah, it just it felt, it, it felt safe and it felt familiar. So 
that's why I gave it a 2.5. I felt like it was a fun, I felt like it was a fun concept and like, just like the most, like the, the poster of like the bear just being all scary and stuff. I just was like, oh, what if Kuma became like that? This is actually quite hilarious. And I, <laughs> so, you know, I, I wanted, that's why I wanted to check it out. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know martial arts, so you could have done way better than they did in the film. But <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I that's nothing. I mean, oh my gosh, uh, the oh god! <laughs> I felt like they had like one Asian character in the movie to just be like, "I do Molly," and like, <laughs> and then yeah. never to be seen for the rest of the movie ever again, ever again, <laughs> except just to be a oh. dick for like one five second <laughs> final shot for him. That was my issue. Like I was coming out to, um, but Lo, like we were talking about before we started all of this, I, I'm pretty sure I've seen this movie, like shot for shot almost, and like, at a boy and everything like that. But I just it's on the tip of my tongue, and I can't remember what movie it is. But I've seen this movie before this movie came out, so that's what it was. But um, Kyle, what is your popcorn rating and why? Well, before I answer, it, there, it's beat for beat. A lot of other, like, there's The Boy. There's some stuff in it that reminded me of that. Like, the creepy doll movies. I don't. I just got pinged by a lot of that. Um, My popcorn rating is three. And my popcorn rating is three because um, there were a couple of moments in the, in the Never Ever, right? That was the space underground and the, the imaginary friend land. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of moments where I said to myself, what if this had been done by Tim Burton? Because that would have been really interesting. And I was, and I saw some visions and then I found out something awful about it from Eric that made me sad um, because I was reading about ha uh, haunted houses. And then, um, but it was really hard to watch it and distance myself from Blumhouse's other bear movie. And I think they might've shot themselves in the foot by releasing the two so close together. <laughs> Because I was like, oh, and then I'm like, this should be interesting. But um, I, so so it was the set design. It was the acting. I did like Chauncey. I could see him versus Megan. I liked him as a character. I would like to see more of him. I don't know if this was the way to introduce him. But, you know, Blumhouse wants to make horror icons. They want to do their own versions of Chucky and, you know, um, all these other characters. So maybe maybe this will be their... Maybe time will tell and this will become a, and I'm sitting here and you're watching the face I'm making and you're shaking your head and you agree with me. And I, I, um, yeah, I can't, I can't. So three, three for effort and the alternate reality where Tim Burton did this movie. Cause that would have been. No, you saying Tim Burton, I could even see if Tim Burton would have done this movie or if Guillermo del Toro would have done this movie, it would have Guillermo been. Guillermo del Toro. Oh, yes. I would have. I would no. That would have gotten like a five out of five for me. <laughs> um, but let's get into it and break down this movie a little bit. So we start off um, with an author named Jessica, um, who married this guy named Max, and he has two daughter daughters, a little girl named Alice, and an older teenager, moody teenager, um, named Taylor. They move. Um, back to Jessica's childhood home um, because that was her happy place. Um, and she just wanted to get back to happiness and everything like that. Um, they move back to um, her childhood home and she's trying to be this good stepmother and attached to them. We get Moody Taylor and she's kind of building a relationship with Alice. Um, but we see a lot of her like struggles in with that um and her painting and trying to get with them but during this uh alice gets called to the basement and finds this bear called chauncey and he starts talking to her and they become really close really quick um he becomes her best friend and she kind of starts pulling away from jessica um then we go forward uh Alice is starting to do these little tasks that Chauncey has set forth for her um, to go, because he's going to take her on this big trip. Um, in this, we also discover that Alice and Taylor have a mentally disturbed mother um, who is very quick and really never mentioned from, again, she breaks into the house, pushes Jessica down, cops come and they take her away. But we see a little issue with... Um, Alice and Taylor and what their dynamic is um, with mothers and everything like that. Um, going forward, 
we meet the next door neighbor named Be or named Liam, and he is kind of a bad influence on Taylor. Uh, he's hitting on her, wants to go get her, take her to a bar where they don't card. Um, and then we move on to the first time we really see Chauncey interact and see Chauncey. Uh, Jessica goes to see her father, who's in a nursing home and is mentally disturbed and doesn't really remember her. Um, but Taylor decides to invite Liam over to the house, and automatically he's like, let's drop Molly, and pulls out these pills from his pocket. And she's like, no, let's just watch a movie. Um, and he's like, let's drink. And she's like, uh, no, put that down. But also in this, he meets Alice, and is kind of just a dick to her. He says, fuck you, and like, is just an asshole. So he goes upstairs and to go get a towel because he drops a bottle of alcohol. And then Alice happens to say, why don't you eat him? So then we start seeing uh, he's grabbing a towel and Chauncey's underneath the towel. And then his little pull cord when he's talking, everything is like going around and around. And then the bear goes to attack him and everything like that. And then he leaves the house because T uh, Jessica gets home and calls his mom and everything like that. Up to this part of the story, nothing really grabbed me. Um, I thought it was just basic, like, okay, they moved to the suburbs. She had an issue. We're going to get this little bear. It's kind of scary and freaky looking, but nothing. We get, like, little tidbits of him talking to her and stuff like that, and the mom. I think nothing really captivated me up to this point in the movie, except for when he was kind of scaring Liam. That was the first part of it. What were your thoughts up until this part of the movie, Kenji? Um, <laughs> the only thing I could think of really that went through my head was clearly Jessica is the one that's in charge of all the money in the house because um, you saw what he left on tour in right it was a powder blue Lexus for the whole band he's going on tour in a powder blue Lexus so I don't know how they were able to buy that house necessarily. Sure, shit wasn't his money. Um, I, a part of me wants to be like, Jessica is the best thing to happen to that family because <laughs> you were living literally in an apartment before this. Mm -hmm. So, but with that said, um, personally, was like. showed him in the trailers i was hoping that he was going to be like that innocent like bystander that gets hurt kind of thing but then you hear more of him and like there's nothing redeeming about him he's just a total <laughs> asshole he's just a total asshole it'd be one thing if it was like he's kind of like a wild kid but then like he makes the mistake of mentioning the bar in front of jessica so oops but then like the fact that it's like, oh, then I'm going to do this thing, and then I'm going to do this thing, and I'm also going to be an asshole to your sister. And it's like, yeah, we want you to be eaten, too. Like <laughs> Sitting in the theater like, Chauncey, Chauncey, Chauncey. No, Chauncey, yes, Chauncey. Anyway. Yeah, and and that's, give it to us. <laughs> I feel like that's a problem. I, here's the thing. Me, personally, I feel like it's much more tragic when everybody is somewhat likable, and they just have, like, that one character flaw, that one character flaw that in the eyes of this ultra, you know, strict demon is like, oh, you did this one thing though. You know, as yeah. opposed to being like, no, you're just a detestable human being. I mean, I'm not saying all, I'm not trying to advocate child death, but Liam is an asshole. And I would not mind, and I, and I was not minding it if he actually, he didn't make it to the end of the movie. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. Like, Liam was an asshole. Like, but for me, like, I mean, congratulations. Uh, Matthew uh, Soto is the guy who plays Liam, which he did a good job at portraying an asshole. Good job. But there was no point to this character because you see him before when he offers her to go to the bar. Then you see him trying to offer her pills and Chansey's, like, scare moment. But then you see him at the end, he just like waves to her or whatever. There was no point to this character. Didn't do anything for the story, really. Like, just feed him to the bear and <laughs> let people look. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it would have been one thing where like, when they like, when 
like uh, we we can we can, basically at the end when the double twist happens, if it was like he's the one that's helping, like just to give this character something of a redeemable arc, just as opposed to just him being like just another neighbor that doesn't care at all. <laughs> the my, the neighborhood watch that doesn't do anything. Anyways. <laughs> Speaking of labor neighbors, I did forget to mention the creepy ex babysitter sitter Gloria. We run into her, and she's like, "I used to babysit you, and like you talked about your imaginary friend, and I, you almost had me believing you, and I made a whole thing out of it." But we meet her, and like she comes in later when we'll go into the rest of it. But um, Kyle, what are your thoughts up to this point of the movie? Like, did it captivate you? Did you want more? What did you think of Liam? <laughs> if you, if the, it's the Liam deserves the bite of 87 club. We love that. Um, no, but uh, I, I, uh, if they really wanted to tell a scary story about distancing, because a lot of this felt like they wanted to tell a scary story about, you know, children coming to trust parents then they should have really, I agree with Kenji, given coming to trust parents or adjust to situations or dealing with parents, because that's why you make an imaginary friend. You make an imaginary friend because you're lonely or you're creative and you're bored and you want to like experiment with playing and creative, creating things. And so if they wanted to do that, they really had an opportunity with Liam, not just to make him an irredeemable character, mm -hmm. but to show some of his home life, because that would have been, that would have made more sense to do more character development than just toss him aside by making him just a, a jerk and then have and then and then uh the the hallway and the blanket and i just so so they had a they had a real opportunity with him to like do more um and then gloria just felt really contrived i don't know i'm really here for the stuff where they got into the the imaginary to the what to, to the 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 imaginary worlds because this one i was just like these the imaginary world sounds infinitely more exciting chauncey i will go with you if it will help me to escape this film please <laughs> because at least it sounds like you've invested time and energy into creating this alternate reality even if there's a reason for it and yeah but uh uh yeah so it was just like okay it, 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 eric you said 2000s movie and it really does feel like that this is definitely oh. a movie from the 2000s Oh yeah, definitely. It just reminds me of all those little ones that they were like shooting out. This reminds me of one of those. Um, but moving on from where we are, after he gets kicked out and everything like that, um, Alice, sorry, Alice continues her little scavenger hunt. She talks to Jessica about getting like a paintbrush or something happy and everything like that. Um, but then we see her Alice goes, or Jessica goes into the room because she has said something to her, or uh, she has said something to her and it upset her, so she goes up um, to comfort her and you can see her moving under the blanket and everything and she's like pouring her heart out to her about her life and scars and everything, and then she happens to hear Alice outside and goes over to the window and Alice is pulling a board down from the fence. And we see Alice walk over to a table and talking to Chansey in her head, um, like, I don't want to do this. Why do I have to hurt myself? And then she changes into a flower. And this is where Jessica realizes Alice is not in the bed. So she walks mm -hmm. over and she pulls over the covers, and it's Chauncey the bear. She freaks out, runs downstairs, gets her in the nick of time to where she just scraps, scrapes herself. And then Jessica realizes this is too much for her. She can't handle an unruly teenager and a little girl who is trying to hurt herself. Um, so she talks to the husband, whatever. He convinces her to bring over uh, a doctor named Dr. Soto, um, who Alice has seen before because of her crazy mother and all of the things that she's been through. So she brings her over, and um, the doctor's like, okay, let me talk to her alone. Alice says, can I bring Chauncey in with me? And Jessica sees her walk out into the hallway, <laughs> bring her in, sit down. And... Alice begins to have this conversation with Chauncey that she didn't want to hurt herself, that she hates him, she doesn't want to be friends with him anymore, gets upset again and runs upstairs. Um, and the psychologist then starts talking to Jessica about how she's seen this before. 
and she's talked to kids before and she's researched this, that it happens that kids get really connected with some imaginary friends as she's had it before to where um, the last boy, she shows her this video and they're talking about the never ever. Um, That's it, the never ever. The never ever. And after the last apartment she had with this boy, a week later he disappeared and nobody knows where he went. And Jessica talking to her, she was just like, well, what did Chansey do? And she was like, well, Chansey's not there. Jessica was like, what do you mean he's not there? She's been seeing this bear the entire time, as we all have come to find out. The bear is imaginary as well. It's all in their head. Nobody else sees the bear, the daughter, the friends, nobody. But come to find out, it is Jessica's imaginary friend, Chauncey Bear, from when she was little, that now Alice has become friends with as well. Come, Jessica, or Chauncey Bear was trying to take Jessica into the Never Ever when she was a little girl, which she successfully did. <clears throat> and the father went in and saved her, looked into his eyes, and then went completely nuts. So she was removed from the home, but she remembers nothing of this. In this finding out and everything, Chauncey Bear manages to take Alice into the Never Ever. Um, they're looking around. Um, Taylor and Alice, or Taylor and Jessica are looking around the neighborhood and they run back into Gloria. Then Gloria takes them in and she's like, nope, imaginary people or imaginary friends exist in a ton of different cultures. We have to go get her. Um, she paints it, makes her own list. They go back into the Never Ever, which was really cool. Um, and then we find out Gloria's entire reasoning for talking to them again was to get into the never, never, never ever again because she wanted to be in there and where anything imagines, you can do anything. And as she's saying this, Chauncey ends up killing her. <laughs> uh, sure. Sorry, Gloria. Um, but then Taylor and Jessica um, end up fighting Chauncey several places. Um, they find Alice and the crazy mom, even though she's like nice now, and they build like this door, get back out. Um, Jessica thinks she gets out. And she writes another book and everybody's happy. And then she realizes she's still in the never ever. <laughs> um, go Taylor for being the person you are. She jumps back into the never ever, ends up getting Jessica out. They get in and paint the door. And then Alice, with something that Chauncey had said earlier with fire magic, ends up lighting the house basement on fire. They get out of the house and let the whole thing burn. Cops show up, everything. Then at the end of the movie, they end up going into a hotel to get a room and they see Chauncey Bear again, but with another little boy. And all of them are like, we see this. Um, we're good. Let's go to a different hotel, leave. And then we really don't know what happens to them. And they, we get a catchy cat, cat. We get a catchy uh, theme song for Chauncey. Um, Kyle, we'll start with you. What did you think about the Never Ever and the rest of the ending of this movie? For me, I liked it. The Never Ever part. I felt like it gave us more and there should have been way more of that. Um, but what were your thoughts? Well, the never ever was definitely that that was the part that gave me Tim Burton, Guillermo del Toro. Like you said, like that was something that we definitely needed to see more of because that was what made this movie so unique and creative. <laughs> I don't think we're going to get that with Krasinski's if, I mean, like it seems like we have the friends in the real world. So to see where they're coming from is the, this dark demonic dimension it, it taps into something very primal. It taps into the reason why a lot of kids have imaginary friends in the first place. And some adults, you know. Um, it taps into the reason why why people have imaginary friends is that, you know, you're in a very spooky place. So to have something that represents such a sense of safety come into a, such a very spooky realm is a really good choice. The acting is fantastic. I really like the twist at the end. They could have left her in there and that would have been very cool. That would have set up for a sequel. I would have been really into that. Um, but the I, I, I thought that they did... The ending was good. I don't like the twist ending with the, oh, he's still following you, because it, it really smacked of, oh, you know, we're just... Good. They should have left her in there. I mean, that would have set up the sequel the best way. If you wanted to have the siblings out there and then have them see it, like, that would have been... That would have been cool. But the, the like, I, I actually, now I'm thinking about it, I would have really enjoyed having the siblings just do, like, their own thing. Because imaginary friends are the domain of children. Like, adults do it, and then adults go to Hollywood and have auditions and make movies and become imaginary people. But um, the kids, that's that's not a dig at anybody at all. Um, but kids. A dig at all of Hollywood. All of Hollywood. <laughs> in, in its entirety is an industry. 
Um, mm-hmm. it, but but that's just that's just it. That's what this movie got wrong for me is that you work in a business that is essentially based on this, that's based on imagination and based on people dealing with imagination. You could have gone a lot farther, and you could have made it a lot darker because with the, huh? I was gonna say with the with the the themes of mental health and everything. As much as I don't like when Blumhouse talks about mental health, because I have some issues with how horror mo- horror movies have to be very careful when it comes to mental health for me. But with the the, the themes of mental health in relation to creativity, they could have gone a lot farther. But I liked it. I mean, it definitely was the better part of the film. Yeah. No, completely. Um, Kenji, before I get to you with what you thought of the rest of this movie and the never ever and everything. I do want to jump into the chat. First off, Nom Talk Network has redeemed Hydrate for all of us. So cheers. Um, and then we do have a couple of different thoughts. Um, Tim Spiration says, this is very Coraline slash Labyrinth when you get into the Ever After. And the whole movie is kind of Coraline-esque. Um, Q-Ball, hi Q, um, says, I had three imaginary friends Leon O, He-Man, and Batman. I would imagine that I would, uh, I would imagine that I would f- be fighting the villains and have a picnic every lunch hour recess. To clarify, in the 1980s, Super Friends, Batman was the Batman that his was his imaginary friend. Um, also, so as you, I want you to talk about the rest of this movie and how you felt, Kenji. But also, I want you to think, um, Cue Ball just redeemed your so punny for you. So think about that. <laughs> so, but yes, what well, were your thoughts? Um, well, well I'll, I'll try to think of something uh, as I'm doing this, but um, definitely, uh, I'll say that the twist with Ozzy being imaginary, I actually was kind of like, Okay, that's cool. I actually didn't see that. Okay, that that actually caught that that was a little bit of a surprise. I wouldn't have expected that because, you know, I almost feel like the part of me is also like, did it really address the bear in this movie though? Not just her. Like I'm sure other people have addressed this bear besides Alice and Jessica. I was like, who else has fucking addressed this bear? I know they have. I'm not fucking crazy. But anyways. <laughs> But other, but other than that, I, I kind of agree with Kyle. The idea of like, I would have been okay with uh, her kind of stuck in the never after, or, or the never ever. Sorry, never after. That's another movie. Um, uh, but yeah, the never. I I definitely, especially with the never ever. I, I wish, I. I, I wish I didn't. Sometimes being a cinephile makes you like see so many of like the same. Ele- you it makes you almost like not surprised by things anymore. And because like I feel like the majority of this film was very was a lot of like okay I I kind of I feel like I've kind of seen a part of this like like the whole thing with uh, trying to fight the trying to trap the trapped the demon at the end kind of reminded me a little bit of the ring with uh, the well and trying to trap her in there ultimately again. Uh, you know, it, it also, you, you know, I, I, I mean, I was definitely was wondering like, when are we actually going to get like one dead in this film actually? And the fact that we finally, I mean, didn't like that it took me an hour and 20, an, almost like an hour and 10 minutes to get to the first real death of the film, but like I, I guess it had its reasons for it. I mean, I know they ended up going with I don't know if Bloomhouse was purposely trying to do PG-13. Actually, you know, now that I think about it, they probably were because if it's PG-13, it means that your audience is gen- generally your audience is bigger. So that's probably why they went with it, but a part of me kind of almost wishes that they had gone the R route because you, like, like I, I feel like even with like the idea of like when first shows up to the house would have actually been okay if Liam just disappeared <laughs> then he just dis- you really have a beef against Liam well no 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 I mean like <laughs> and, and then that leads to like well 
Where the hell is Liam? I don't know. He was just here a second ago. Well, you know, my son came over to your house, you know. It's like, my son came over to your house, you know, to hang out with your daughter, and now he's nowhere to be seen. It's like, you had somebody over at your house? Why well, You weren't supposed to find out. Well, where is he? Well, I don't know. Then you find I'm out she never had a son. He was her imaginary <laughs> friend the whole time. Um... <laughs> hey, hey. Well, that, and I agree Lord, with you. That would have given the film word. way more stakes if he would have disappeared and they were like looking for him. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and the whole well, idea he... is that the whole idea is that that, that weird like jump jump monster, whatever the monster that that basically like kidnapped him and then it's like once they realized oh my gosh he, Liam was kidnapped by that mon- entity and now Alice has, has been taken by that entity we've got to save them both and then we find like some weird like upside down world where like we find like them in wow. like cocoons like they do and like and like like it's like an alien movie but you know Liam is like been you know stuffed with porridge and shit like that I don't know because it's a bear I don't know <laughs> Honey, (laughs) honey, no, that's see, but that's just it. They really could have gone much, much darker if they really played into the mental health themes. If they really made, if they had more never ever. If they'd had, if I'm, I'm just mad because there's such, there's such a cool thing with having a create a character who's like a children's book author doing this. There used to be this. I used to have this headcanon about um, Monsters Incorporated that. And I, I saw it on Tumblr years ago that Boo from Monsters Incorporated became a um, character designer for movies because she had all this experience. And it's like, it would have been cool if they tied it into that for, for Jessica. It would have been cool if they'd had more of an emphasis on just how genuinely unnerving. It would have been cool, as Kenji said, if they'd gone for the R rating and made a movie for about the, the, the strained connection between mental health and childhood and creativity. Actually, it's funny you say that because I do know that, like, like Chauncey's final form, Chauncey, uh, at the very end of the film, very <laughs> much, yeah, the, he's very much almost. I was, I was, I was it just, he had multiple legs, right? Yeah, he had like. Yeah. Okay, because like, so it was clearly like obvious that like, her spider from her book. Hmm based on this demon version of Chauncey. But the thing is, they didn't quite make it seem that way because Chauncey was still in, like, you know, like, he he, he was still in form two. He hadn't gone full Frieza mode yet. So he was, like, still, like, in this bear shape. And the, and as a result, it just kind of seemed like, well, how does this bear, what is this, how does this bear tie into Jessica? And then, of course, at the very end, we see, like, oh, the darkness of this theater and the darkness of the picture we it's like we kind of have a game of thrones thing where you're kind of doing this with the image trying to see trying to make it out but if you, did you look hear what at happened it you with, can't see the legs did you hear what happened with bloody disgusting i saw this on twitter and it was it was hilarious um the guy who was the uh editor of bloody disgusting was like i can't see chauncey this is actually really sad i want to see a picture of him and the studio sent him a picture a clear picture of chauncey and he's like well, I haven't seen the movie yet, so this is great, but thanks. This is <laughs> the I mean, no. I, it's true. I didn't like that he became like a Dementor at one point. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was just... So, I do want to get into... I do want to read you guys some of the reviews that have been out there and get your thoughts on these because this movie is not getting not being very well received like people are like it's a movie go see it i guess maybe um one of the rudest ones that i've seen because it's only (laughs) as a 28 right now on rotten tomatoes it's not doing well um but one of the (laughs) um one of the ones that i saw that i I do want to get your thoughts on this because it, it, it rings true and I think it is actually true about this movie um, the quote is and the review is imaginary skips the directive to entertain coming up coming off as stiff pedestrian and dreary 
as a March space filler can get. Ow. Yeah. But I have to say, I agree with that. Um, a couple of other ones. Um, not a total catastrophe, but Paris perilously close to being one. Is it too obvious to say that imaginary simply is lacking in imagination? Which I do have to agree. I don't think this was as imaginary as it could have been, nor should this movie... They should have definitely tabled this for a while and worked on it. Like I did mention earlier, I think... I don't, and I've seen a couple of people say, I think this was just their way of getting something in to create a um, haunted house for Halloween Horror Nights um, to do what Bloomhouse always does and has theirs. Um, what do you guys think about these reviews and the Horror Nights potential haunted house? Uh, we'll start with you on this one, Kenji. Um, I kind of, it's, I mean, that first one was just harsh. Uh, <laughs> Like to the point that it was rude. It almost makes you think it was pulling off that act. It was pull, trying to do the ritual to get into the never ever. <laughs> that just hurt, just hurt the creators of the film so they can get that blue flame going. Um, but yeah, I kind of. It does seem like. I mean, it, it's also just kind of sad because you have films that are really good, you know, that are being canceled, like. Just for the sake of tax write-offs, I'm looking at you, Warner Brothers Discovery. I'm looking at you, Coyote versus Acme. Oh, my gosh. But, like, the point is we have a lot of these great films cut for the sake of whatever reason. But then we have these other films, which I don't know who it's for. I certainly don't think it's for the shareholders. And I don't really think who, but I also don't know who it's for. So, <laughs> like, but then makes makes you go, well, then who is this movie for? So why is this movie being allowed to be made? I mean, obviously it's a completely different production house. I get it. But with that being said, though, it's like it's just sad to know that there are really good movies out there that that are worth seeing the light of day that aren't when when there are movies like like you said, a space filler in March. You know, Madam just, just just being on theater. Oh, 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 I I haven't even seen it. Don't. Oh Kenji, oh Kenji, oh. do your do yourself a favor and and don't. You know, or get really. <laughs> get... I've also seen reviews that says like this is worse than Madam Web. This is not worse than Madam Web. This is oh, actually sure. viewable. So. Yeah. But anyway, back to imaginary. <laughs> Kyle, what are your thoughts? <laughs> this is the Liam and Madam Web hate power hour just so everyone's clear um okay here's my here's my thing about blumhouse and I, and i'm not speaking from i'm not trying to speak from vice project i'm trying to speak from jason blum has a really solid business model where he will make very cheap movies he will toss them at the wall some of them will hit very very big and some of them won't some of them will be space fillers the last two that blumhouse has done for 2024 have been space fillers um there's no amount of stephen king quotes that can save night swim um because that was terrible um imaginary in another imaginary lives for me imaginary lives in the reality where madam webb is actually good um it's her never ever it's her to, it's, it's 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 kyle's never ever it's kyle's it's kyle's never ever it's the the alternate reality where um you know sony Sony made a really good movie and um Mad Madam this... Webb's reality is <laughs> the imaginary is good. And and this is and, and and Jason Blum said, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna spring for Del Toro. Guys, get Del Toro on the phone. We're gonna make this. That's my forever. That's that's him just making solid decisions about what could have been a really cool idea. Um no, but um I I, I... It does it I so I, I applaud the business model. It was a filler. That first one was really rude though. Um but it, it was a it was a filler film that could have been it it could have been good. I'm I'm just at this point with the, the way that the industry goes, I'm happy people are getting work. And that's yeah. that sucks to say, but I'm really happy that people are getting work on things, even if it's even if it's terrible. 
Um, I just, Blum is, um, the imaginary, I can see them trying to make imaginary, like, a, a really unique thing. And then as far as the horror house goes, you have a property right there that you can use to make a house and you're not doing it and I'm mad about it. So if you're trying to, if they're trying to shuffle this under the wire to get a house, a Megan imaginary house, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not about that. Well, like Kenji mentioned earlier, it the rights for um, Five Nights at Freddy's is probably way too expensive for them to want to spend the money on. They'd sell out the event in minutes. I mean, <laughs> they I mean, would. It would be full of screaming children, and it wouldn't be fun. But it would. They'd sell it out in seconds. Well, um, I mean, at this point for me, Blumhouse hasn't done anything in the past couple of years that I've actually enjoyed. Um, not even Five Nights. What you enjoyed? Freddy's. What was the last one you enjoyed? I'm I'm not right. trying to dismiss you. I'm just curious. Megan, I kind of enjoyed. Oh. Uh, Five Nights at Freddy's. I think they did a better job in Willy's Wonderland with than they did at Five Nights at Freddy's. Yes. That so, I will. Like they haven't really done anything to captivate <laughs> me. A lot. Um, this one I was hoping, and it didn't live up to my tropes. So unfortunately, I can't. I honestly can't remember if. If any of the recent uh, recent horror films that I've seen are even Boom House films, so <laughs> it's like uh, oh, so, I don't I'm know. trying to think of the last one I remember. But um, before we end, because we are getting towards the end here, I did want to bring up a couple of things that the um, director and writer Jeff Wadlow did say that he tried to do. Okay, he tried to um reflect this film and give homage to Poltergeist, Nightmare oh, on right. Elm Street, and Labyrinth in a little bit of a way. Did you guys get those feelings of those movies? Do you I think didn't he should have done that? I um, definitely Kendrick. got vibes of Pol I definitely well, I mean we were talking about this earlier, Eric. Like I was definitely I was saying it reminded me of Poltergeist almost. Like like with I mean definitely for sure. I mean uh how about you Kyle? What what, what did you I mean, I mean, did you feel that too? Like, oh, I can or... see. I, I can, yeah. No, I, I can see all three. It, um, it makes me wish. Again, it makes me wish that they'd lean harder, harder into the horror for it, with the poltergeist, though. Because hearing that confirmed, I'm like, you really could have done something very, very cool if you'd leaned. And I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm, I'm, but if you, if they'd really leaned into the mental health aspect of it and really, really fucked with the audience's heads. They could have really done a cool homage to Poltergeist with this, like a really cool. I want to go to the Never Ever, and I want to live in my reality where the movies are good, man. Like, no, um, <laughs> but Roe v. Wade hasn't been overturned. <laughs> Coyote versus Acme has been released. No, Coyote, been... Exactly, Batgirl. <laughs> we actually get to watch Batgirl. <laughs> <laughs> Because because this this was Jason Blum Springs for this guy to write it and Guillermo del Toro to direct it. This guy writing it and Guillermo del Toro directing it. Huh? Huh? Maybe. Maybe. Well, I feel like if, if that was the case, I feel like Guillermo del Toro would be like, "We're we're going to we're, we're going to change the script. This the, the, the script is shit. We're going to change the script." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, definitely. And you Five know, Guillermo is like, like, "We're we're tossing this." <laughs> As he, as he and basically he rewrites it while he's playing with kaiju monster toys. <laughs> I oh, but I will say, the girl who played Alice was acting circles around everybody. Yes, yes. I was like, I was so surprised. I was like, no child should have that comedic timing. Right. <laughs> yes, because kids that are kid, kid actors are normally veer between being terrible. Or like genuinely being genuinely upstaging people. This is one of the first kids I've seen in a while that was like on it. And no, I didn't hate on the acting entirely. Like you said, Alice uh, Paper Brown, uh, Piper Brown, who plays Alice, little girl, definitely ran at circles around these actors. Um, but Dewanda uh, Dewanda Rise, who played Jessica, Piper uh, um, Tegan Burns, who played Taylor, Tom Payne, who played the husband Max. Uh, Betty Buckley, who played Gloria, Veronica Falcone, who played Dr. Soto, everything. They were okay. Like, they did, they, they did an acting. It wasn't horrible. They did an acting. 
<laughs> uh, could that be on our merch now? They did an acting. No, they did an acting. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't the worst, but she definitely did run circles around them. Um, Kyle, before we get on to our final thoughts, and would you recommend this movie and everything, I do want to say I just noticed the clown behind you, and that scared me more than this video uh, than this movie did. <laughs> like I caught it, and I was like, "What the hell?" Uh, that scared me more than this. Movie. Well, and this bullet just goes. <laughs> just now it moves. You watch it, and standing behind me, and its head turns. It just jumps out of the box, and I'm just like, Kyle, get out. The collar is <laughs> coming from inside the house. Run. See, that's, um, that's, that, that's imaginary, too, right there. It's people on Zoom calls, and then the, the imaginary friends just, like, you know, just you call. Didn't Kyle. we already have that movie? Wasn't it called Unfriended? Yeah, that was called Star, Unfriended. Starring, starring Jacob Wysocki. Such a good comedic actor. They did another one to where it was like, they did a spell thing, and it was like Unfriended. Ugh. No, they no, have no. That in, in this one, in this one, it's adults, and I actually get my commentary on creativity because it's all the people that Jessica knows that work in publishing or whatever, and suddenly all of their imaginary friends just start attacking them and trying to eat them and take them places, and then you get the evil publishing person who's like trying to get all of these creative people into the never ever for some reason, and then you just continue and and I'm to actually have an idea to make this movie better. The okay, so in my in my idea, my idea with this is you really lean into the backstory, you really lean into the kids, you don't see the dad. Liam has more of a backstory with his parents and his parents connected to him. You um you really lean into the idea that Jessica's the only adult dealing with kids, and you lean into the weirdness that comes with being something very somebody very creative and then disconnecting that from your childhood because it's like, you know. We love our bears. I love my bears very, very much. I love my stuffed animals very much, but I'm an adult. And it's like, there's a point where you have to disconnect from that. And, you know, so you you, you use a lot of the themes about childhood. You use a lot of the themes about family, about her growing up. And yeah, it's a little bit labyrinthy and maybe a little bit cliche, but she does end up sticking in the never ever. But this is the, this is 2024. And these are kids that you know, um, if you really want to keep trying to push the 80s homages, Blumhouse, lean into it. Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead this. The children are saving the adults. Like, the adults end up in the never ever. The adults don't want to exist in this world anymore. And the kids got to go and the kids got to remind them, like, you got to be here for this. Or the adults don't get saved. And I would do that. I would, I would, the adults don't get saved. The adults turn out to be either the bad guys or like, you know, or just so completely disconnected from reality that the kids have to cope with that level of horror. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. I'd like that a lot more. Um, so before I get you guys final thoughts, I do want to say like, I think this movie overall was okay. Go see it or wait for it to come on streaming. It's like worth a watch. It's a good, like, quick, like, jump scare film. Don't expect to be overly scared. Um, they did it. It's a movie. Go see it. They did an acting. Um, <laughs> uh, go see it. It's okay. It's good for what it was, but it's not nothing to home write home about. Um, I think that Blumhouse should definitely stick to, like, um, their insidious movies and stuff like that. Something that is actual horror, horror for them because they're good at that. This mm -hmm. stuff, they should stay away from PG-13. Um, but, Kenji, what are your final thoughts, and do you recommend this movie? Uh, I mean, I mean, it's worth a watch, but I wouldn't pay the ticket price to go see it again. I'd probably wait till, I'd, I'd probably tell people to wait till streaming. Oh, Honestly, yeah. I mean, they, they still make, they still make their, you know, their, their fraction of change. <laughs> Kyle's just getting eaten by the bear. Uh, I mean, honestly, like, I, I mean, if you're a Bloomhouse fan, you know, go see it because, you know, that means you're probably used to what the, the studio produces. So check it out, you know, because if you're looking for like a really good horror film, I don't think this is, it. <laughs> yeah, this is not it. <laughs> um, Kyle, what are your final thoughts on this film? And would you recommend? Um, I can recommend three other horror films that I'm super excited for that aren't this one. But yeah, I mean, it's... it's 
<laughs> though i mean like yeah like it, it actually the one i'm the one i'm thinking of is the one that looks like it's also dealing with childhood nostalgia and going weird places which is something a bunch of friends of mine have seen and recommended called i saw the tv glow which is about a tv show i guess it looks really really good um this one though like you know if you if, if you if you're a big fan of blumhouse like me you can see it if you're you know i i wouldn't pay a full price for it if you want to take your kids to, if you want to introduce your kids to horror, you want to introduce your children to horror and you want to take them to a spooky film and you feel like they're a little more grown up than like the five or six year old crowd. Maybe they're in their early teens, you know, maybe you're a cool parent. Maybe they're in their like, you know, preteens, early teens and you want to introduce your kids to horror and you kind of want to get their vibe and see if like they're going to be the kind of kid that wants to go to horror cons with you. Blumhouse is releasing movies for that demographic recently. These are the parent, these are movies that, you know, if your kid wants to watch them, you can take them to see them and they're going to be spooky, but there's going to be not enough is going to be shown that you're going to be like, okay, I have to explain to my child why this person was bitten in half by a bear or why this person went insane. And I have to talk to my kid about this. And it's like, no, there's magic and whimsy and you're not going to see the person eaten because, you know, it's in shadows and you're not going to see this and that and the other thing. Um, so it, it's a movie for parents to take their kids to if they want to see horror movies. If you're an adult horror fan, you can wait until it comes on streaming. No, I completely agree. I, I agree with you. Like, this is a good teen early development horror movie. I was watching like like poltergeist and scary scary movies when I was that age. But that's just my family. I grew up in the 90s and was born in the 80s. So <laughs> want to know why millennials are messed up, friends? That's why we were watching those movies. <laughs> <laughs> that and we're not getting paid enough. You said that Jesus, that's a fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> but What's he advocating for workers' rights? What? <laughs> has your daughter picked up has your daughter picked up ventriloquism lately? No, she's fine. <laughs> well, uh, but I do that is all the time we have for tonight, guys. Thank you so much for talking about uh imaginary. Um uh you guys let everybody know out there uh where they can find you. Um Kenji, why don't you start? Uh you can find me on uh social media, Instagram at Kenjinator. Uh, you can also find me on Twitch at the Kenjinator, uh, where I sometimes stream, but not very much. But uh, on Sundays, you can catch me on yeah, KD in LA, where I do Dungeons and Dragons with my dad. Best show. Well, thank you, thank you for being here, um, Kyle. Where can everybody find you out there? So I'm gonna plug my TikTok, even though we don't know what the status of TikTok is gonna be. Uh, Caroline C A R O L I N G underscore cosplay. Um, if you want to see me talk about horror movies, do unboxings, cosplay from independent horror video games, that's where you want to go. Um, nah, 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 nah. I, I, Blue Sky, I'm Kyle Podig, K Y L E P O D D I G. And Instagram, I'm Carolyn and Phantom, C A R O L Y N I N F A N D O M. And one day I'm going to brand all of this together so I can just say on all platforms, you can find me here. Um, but Instagram doesn't let you change your names anymore, so. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, but you can find me, I'm Eric Ramirez, your host again, on all platforms <laughs> at Heartless7. That's H-A-R-T-L, the number three, S-S-7. Um, but be sure uh, to join uh, us on our next um stream uh but thank you all for tuning in and be sure to join our discord that's what i meant to say um to keep this conversation going as well as subscribing to all of our other platforms at non talk network um tune in on friday where we are gonna uh go over the last two episodes of the avatar the last airbender live action um again my name is eric ramirez and everybody out there have a non-morific barrel day bye